emergency. An injury crash at Highway 63 and Highway 30. Huge, chaotic, just massive destruction. I heard sirens. I did hear the helicopter. The driver had fallen asleep. He had went through the stop sign. I don't think he braked at all. We just hit and then we just spun. Many of the occupants were then thrown a fairly significant distance. Where are my babies? Where are my babies? That was the deadliest drunk driving incident in Minnesota history. Four people were killed. Two people were critically injured. They never stood a chance. They probably never saw it coming. Sometimes I think I'm going to wake up and it's all going to be just one hell of a nightmare, but I, every day I wake up, the reality sets in that I am without two children, without a grandchild, and two very, very special friends. Rita Siha and her fiance, Terry Milholland, were celebrating the birth of their little boy last Memorial Day weekend. And it was quite the miracle baby because I was told 12 years ago I couldn't have any more kids. Raymond was just five weeks and five days old when the happy couple took him to Austin to meet the rest of the family. We grilled out with the family, had a good afternoon, and we left there about 7.30. Three of those family members tagged along for the ride back to Rochester. Rita's 19-year-old daughter, Heidi, her two-year-old grandson, Carter, and friend, Jared Beers. I then called Sherry, my son's girlfriend, and said, can you go upstairs and shut the bedroom window because it's going to be too cold for Raymond. But Sherry wouldn't have needed to because Raymond never made it home that night. Minutes later, Rita's van was T-boned by a drunk driver who fell asleep at the wheel. His blood alcohol level was nearly two and a half times the legal limit. He blew through a stop sign, hitting 68 miles per hour one second before impact. His car went flying into a ditch, ultimately landing upside down. Amazingly, he avoided serious injury. Rita's van went into a spin and then into the opposite ditch. The force was enough to shear off the entire driver's side of the van and the trunk. Nearly everyone was thrown from the vehicle. My daughter Heidi was found here. Carter and Raymond, one of them up there, and one over here, and Jarrah was way back there. Rita managed to survive. So did her grandson, Carter. Both were taken to St. Mary's Hospital in critical condition. Both were hanging on by a thread. I remember whispering in his ear that his mommy wanted him. Carter? And Grandma was okay, and she'd take care of things down here if he would just go to his mom because her arms were open and she wanted him. And it wasn't much longer and he passed away. Carter died the morning of May 29th. I love you babies. Laid to rest in the same casket as his mother and baby Raymond. I wanted her to hold the babies and know they were secure and not alone. Rita would miss Jarrah's funeral and the chance to say goodbye to her fiance one month shy of their wedding. His children had him cremated and sent to Arkansas before Rita ever came out of her coma. She'd spend the next 10 days in the hospital, recovering from 10 broken ribs, two punctured lungs, a ruptured spleen, and a dislocated shoulder. But long after her injuries have healed, the emotional scars remain. I love them and miss them so much. And the earth isn't the same without them. This is where she comes to see them now finding solace among the wreckage. These are parts from the van. This is where she comes to celebrate birthdays and anniversaries and to sing to her angels their favorite song. It's the core. And among the five white crosses, a light, giving hope that one day she'll be able to sing this to them in heaven, a light that burns bright through the night, just like the one on Rita's front porch. The last one in at night, last one to come home, I always shut the porch light off. They haven't come home yet, so we can't shut it off. It's been 365 days since Rita lost her family in a drunk driving accident. 365 days without hugs, without laughter, <laughs> without the ones she loves. I um, 
wonder sometimes how I do get through. Um, I guess I take it one day at a time, but it's, there's some days that are just totally unbearable, and those are the days that I don't get out of bed. And if that's where Rita spent the rest of her days, most people would understand. But Rita isn't most people. Some days I wish I would have just went with them. But I think the good Lord left me here because I still need to get the word out not to drink and drive. Out of the ashes of a year's worth of tragedy came the crusade of a lifetime. Rita will not only tour the state to speak out about drunk driving, but will do so with a piece of the accident by her side. This is all that's left of that van. A Mother's Day present meant to keep Rita and her five-week-old son safe from harm. Now a mangled mess of metal and plastic. And in the weeks to come, it will be loaded onto a flatbed trailer as part of Rita's mission to end drunk driving once and for all. Drinking and driving is like loading up a gun. Once you put the keys in the ignition you've been drinking, you're loading a gun to go off. If it's one in a hundred that sees that van and thinks, you know, I'm not going to drink and drive, that's a pretty powerful message. If you actually see the vehicle, if you actually can, you know, walk right up to it and, and see the blood stains, um, it, it gets to be a lot, have a lot more impact on, on people. And you get people to think about it. And hopefully, if they've consumed a couple of beverages, alcoholic beverages, they might remember that scene before they get behind the, their own wheel. But Rita isn't stopping there. You can preach all you want not to drink and drive. That doesn't mean people are going to obey the law. So Rita is setting out to change the law. As it stands now, driving under the influence for the first time is a misdemeanor in Minnesota. The same as if you were to drive without a license. It doesn't come with jail time, only a fine and probation, where it's easy to fall through the cracks. Misdemeanor probation officers generally might have three, four, five hundred cases at any one time. They can't possibly supervise those people that strict. Uh, so it would take gigantic additional resources in, in corrections, in prosecutors, in defense attorneys, and in uh, the court system. And a complete paradigm shift in the legislature including a massive increase in funding to the court and correction system. If we had those resources, we could do a better job, but that's a huge if. And it needs to stop at the courts, not the law enforcement taking them off the street and the courts putting them back on the streets. But local law enforcement agencies say they could benefit from more resources too. Are we doing enough? Uh, obviously the problem still exists, so there's a lot of work to be done. And they'd like more manpower to do it. We feel if we had that uh, a squad of four officers and probably a supervisor, that we could certainly put a pretty significant dent into the, the drunk driving problem. If we have more, more officers on the road, yeah, likely we're going to take more drunks off the road. But that could take years. In the meantime, Rita will continue spreading her message to anyone that will listen. If I stop one person, I've done what I feel like I'm out to do. So no one else has to go 365 days without a hug, without laughter, and without the ones they love. In Rochester, Sarah Swistak, ABC6 News. That was the deadliest drunk driving incident in Minnesota history. Four people were killed, two people were critically injured. They never stood a chance. He probably never saw it coming. Sometimes I think I'm going to wake up and it's all going to be just one hell of a nightmare, but I, every day I wake up, the reality sets in.